So today is week two of a three-part collection of messages we put together called Ghost of Christmas Past. And what we're talking about is those painful things that seem to resurface at this time of the year. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And what we want to do in this series is we want to let God speak into those painful things. So I want to warn you that the message I'm going to give to you tonight is going to be a little bit more heavy than it normally is because we're going to talk about something that that just weighs on a lot of us. We're going to talk about the uh, deeply painful emotion called shame. And shame is something that could be soul-wrenching and crushing and cause so many of us this time of year to just feel like it's the worst thing that's happening out of all the 12 months, this is the worst. So go with me to the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 54. That's where we're going to start tonight in our message. We're going to do just one verse tonight as I read this to you. I'm going to read to you uh, Isaiah chapter 54, Verse 4, this is what it says. It says, Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Do not be discouraged, for you will not suffer disgrace. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the disgrace of your widowhood. You will remember no more. Around Christmas, many people battle with the emotion of shame. I'm guessing if the majority of you, if I were to say, hey, think back in your life, I would bet that the majority of you could think of a time when you experienced something and it caused you that feeling of shame. I can remember one of the very first times in my life where I experienced shame. It was in the third grade, Miss Napier's class, the class teacher that you never want to get. I don't know how it was for you growing up, but we didn't have parents who could go to the school and and get the teacher that we wanted. We waited all summer long. And then the week before school, we would go over to the elementary school and they would post them with paper on the front of the school whose class you were in. You would just pray that you got the teacher that you really wanted. And I walked up that year and it was Miss Napier. And Miss Napier is the teacher that has the mole on her face right here. You know what I'm talking about? Like, for real, has a mole on her face. Like, Nanny McPhee, size mole on her face. And she was known as the strictest teacher in the elementary school. And all I can remember is thinking to myself, I have to work extremely hard to make sure that I don't get Miss Napier upset with me. I don't want her to yell at me. I don't want her to be mad at me. I don't want her to punish me. I don't want her to think that I'm a bad kid. And there was one day that I just couldn't avoid causing myself to feel some shame in front of her. And here's what happened. I I was always a good kid in school. I I I wouldn't get in fights. I wouldn't talk back to the teacher other than the time my music teacher wanted me to uh, play the recorder. (laughs) That is the world's most awful sounding instrument I think that we've ever created, especially if you put it in the hands of elementary students, because all we want to do is just make squeaky noises with it. And in music class, I refused. I'm not going to play a recorder. And she said, Coy, get out of my class. So that was the only time I'd gotten in trouble that was in the second grade. And so here we go in the third grade, and I have never gotten in trouble other than that moment. And there was a day that I was really fighting and trying to avoid getting in trouble. But all I wanted to do was just go to the bathroom. That's it. That's all I wanted to do. I believed if I could just go to the bathroom that I could avoid getting myself in a bad situation with Miss Napier because the reason I needed to go to the bathroom is because I was feeling like I was about to get sick. And I'm a kid who also doesn't like to feel sick and and, and vomit because my family was the kind of family who whenever I would get to that place where I would throw up, it's it became a family joke. They would laugh at how I threw up. Like, I don't know what other kind of families do that if you laugh at your family members when they throw up, but my family would laugh at me, and they'd be like, you sound so weird when you throw up. And so I would go into the bathroom, and my family would be laughing at me, and so I did not want anybody to know that I was sick, but I needed to go to the bathroom so that I could get this taken care of. And so I went up to Miss Napier, and I said, I, I, I need to go to the bathroom And she said, no, you don't. Go back to their seat and sit down. And so as a kid that didn't want to get in trouble, I just walked back to my seat and sat down. I thought, I I can hold this down a little bit longer. And then I couldn't much longer. And so I went back to Miss Napier and I said, I really need to go to the bathroom. And she said, no, you don't. Not until I'm done teaching. Go back to your seat. So I went back to my seat and I held it down. And you have all probably experienced this before where it starts to rise. 
in your throat. You can almost taste it on your tongue. And I tried my best to keep myself and prevent that from happening like in the middle of the classroom, but I couldn't hold it anymore. And so as I was sitting there in the middle of class, I just threw up all over my desk and all the kids looked at me and I got embarrassed. And so I run up to her trash can and decided to throw up the rest of it in her trash can. And then I had to run out of the classroom into the bathroom all by myself. And then after I was done, I had to walk the march of shame back into my classroom where my kids all my, t- my classmates all saw me throw up the kid whose family makes fun of him for making so much noise. I will never forget that moment, never, because I felt a sen- sense of shame in that moment. And I'm guessing some of you in this room, maybe it's not the same story as mine, but I'm guessing there's something in your life where you have done something and it has caused you to feel a sense of shame. And the reason why so many of us battle with shame is because we connect the what with the who. (laughs) We connect the what that I did with the who that I am. I did something bad, so I am bad. They rejected me, therefore I am nothing to anybody. After what I did, what we think is, then I am worthless. And then we put words to it. Before long, we start thinking about ourselves, I'm defective, I'm damaged, I'm broken, I'm flawed. I'm ugly, I'm dirty, I'm useless, I'm unlovable, I'm pitiful, I'm weak, I am unwanted. Shame makes us believe those things about ourselves. And we walk around and it's like a sign above our heads that we feel everybody reads, but we're the only one that knows that it's really there. Counseling has a phrase that they use and it's called shame-based thinking. And shame-based thinking, this concept, it, it impacts us in three different ways we know after doing some research. And, and one of the ways that shame-based thinking impacts us is that it has a tendency of making us become very vulnerable to perfectionism. Where we try to kind of force down the shame that we're feeling by excelling and performing at an extremely high level. Another way that shame-based thinking affects us is that we become highly critical of ourselves and in turn, highly critical of everyone else around us. And then the third way that shame-based thinking affects us is that it causes us to become people who use self-defeating thoughts as a way to protect ourselves and and as a way to escape. So we think of the worst possible outcome, and thinking of that causes us to sabotage almost any opportunity and relationship, which is why Christmas can get so crazy. Christmas can get so crazy because you're sitting at the table and you're having dinner with everyone. Uh, Maybe at your grandma's house or maybe it's at your house or maybe uh, some of us now, we just go to a restaurant on Christmas so we don't have to prepare all the food. But you're sitting there and then all of a sudden your mom lashes out at you for no good reason at all. And you're wondering, why is my mom lashing out at me right now? And it's because she's dealing with some serious identity warping shame and then your dad gets up from wherever you are together as a family and with friends and he leaves the room and he disappears and he isolates himself for the rest of the time that everybody else is hanging out and you're wondering why does my dad do this why does my dad always get up and remove himself from the party and the reason why is because it's in, it's his unhealthy way of coping with a very real and internal sense of shame And then you're somewhere around people during the Christmas season, and everybody that's around you seem to be poking and prodding at the fact that you're still single. They make comments about the fact, well, why why are you still single? And you're asking yourself, why do they do this to me every single holiday, especially Christmas? Why do they care if I'm single? It's not their problem. It's not theirs to worry about. And why do they have to bring it up every single Christmas? And the reason why is because they've struggled They've struggled to achieve something that they've wanted in their life. And then what's your reaction? And your reaction is to become extremely critical of everyone because deep down inside of you, you have your own sense of shame. 
And so what I want to do this Christmas is I want us to think about and I want us to pray and I want us to imagine that God can do something, a very strong, real healing work in our lives to set many of us free from the dark and devastating emotion of shame. That's my prayer for all of you. And my prayer comes from the prophet Isaiah in his book in chapter 54, verse 4, where God speaks to the Israelites what I believe God would speak to you. Where God said, fear not, you will no longer live in shame. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, there is no more disgrace for you. You will no longer remember the shame of your youth. Which causes me to ask the question, how in the world is it possible for us to become completely free of the shame of our past? How is it possible? In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 9, it it tells us this. It tells us that Jesus is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us if we are willing to confess. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 9, it tells us that God is so good that God will forgive you even though you don't deserve it. God will forgive you so that you no longer have to live continuing in this place where you feel a deep sense of shame. God is that good that God forgives you. The problem for many of us, though, (laughs) is that we know intellectually that Jesus forgives us. And we know intellectually that God wants to make us new. But in our hearts, it's still polluted with shame. We've already learned in Bible school, for God to love the world, that God gave God's only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And most of us have walked through the sinner's prayer that we've created in the 21st century where we say if you just pray with all of your heart to receive Jesus and, and, and confess your sins, then, then God's going to forgive you. Like we, we know those things and we've walked through those steps, but our hearts are still darkened by a sense of shame because we did that. This is who I am. I kind of want to explain this to you using a different story from the Bible. In the Old Testament, the Israelites, God's people, were slaves for 430 years. For 430 years, 430, for 430 years, they were slaves. After 430 years, most of us, if we were slaves for that long and have been passed down from generation to generation that your grandpa was a slave and your grandma was a slave and then their parents were slaves and then their parents were slaves and then their parents were slaves, you eventually get to the place where you think to yourself, I am nothing. (laughs) My life is insignificant. There's not a lot of value to my life because, because I'm just a slave. And if you're not familiar with this story in the Old Testament, God does something. God raises up a leader named Moses who sets them free from their slavery. After 430 years, they're finally set free. But then if you read the rest of the story, do you understand what happens next? Because what happens next is that we realize that they are free on the outside, but they haven't been set free on the inside. They've been rescued out of slavery, but but slavery hasn't been taken out of them. They are free in person, but they're not free in their hearts. Because after they're freed from slavery, they wander around for 40 years looking for this land that God had promised to them. And during these 40 years where they've been set free from the ones who have held them captive and told them who they are and covered with them shame. But now they're free, but all they do as they're wandering around is not listen to God and disobey God's ways and wonder where God is and worship other idols and believe that they are who they've always been the last 430 years, because as they're wandering in the desert, looking for the place that God said God would give to them, they reach a point in their lives where they say, it might be better just to just go back to Egypt and be slaves, because at least there we know we will have food. Shame followed them for 40 years. And it told them, this is who you are. 
I want to be a little bit transparent with you. We don't have a lot of time for me to tell you all of my story, but I can tell you a portion of it. I want to tell you how in my own life, God has taken me on a journey to overcome what shame-based thinking looks like for me. Because ever since I can remember, I I don't know, (laughs) ever since I can remember, all I've ever wanted to do was to be as good as people expected me to be. Like that was little coy. You tell me to do it, and I wanted to do it. You tell me how to do it, and I wanted to do it that way. I I never wanted to get in trouble. I never wanted to act out. I wasn't the, the kid who never did anything wrong, but that's who I wanted to be. People have heard my story before, a part of it, and, and there's never been a moment in my life where I haven't known myself to be a follower of Jesus. I can't remember a day. My parents tell a story of when I was four years old and we went to church. We went to church at a, at a United Brethren Church. I don't even know if those really even exist much anymore, but we went to a United Brethren Church at four years old, and, and once a month they would invite all the kids into the service. And this particular service that I was a part of, uh, the preacher invited everybody to come forward and receive Jesus into their life, an altar call. We don't really do those a whole lot anymore. People are way too afraid to come forward and pray and for people to watch them and think that they have some shame that they're carrying with them. But back then, we would walk forward and we would pray. And the pastor gave the invitation that day, if anybody would like to come forward and pray to receive Jesus, then please come now. At four years old, that's the service that I was a part of. And my parents said as they were watching everybody else, which is what we all do, there goes Jimmy. Yeah, he definitely needs to go to the altar. And there goes Suzanne. And, uh, man, she's been there ten times, but I don't think it's worked. But maybe the 11th will get her there. And um, there goes Johnny. And, um, man, he just, I don't even know if going to the altar is going to help him. But thank goodness he's going. And we would just kind of cry watching people go. And as my parents are watching people go, they didn't see me slip out. <laughs> and so when they're we're finally deciding to look around where is Koi, they, 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 we, where did he go? And they got scared a little bit. And this isn't a small town where you don't really, about, don't really worry about kids getting kidnapped, and especially in church. <laughs> so where did your little four-year-old go? And so they start looking, and then they see me down at the altar. And they walk down, and they... As they tell the story, I don't remember it a whole lot. As they walk down, they, are you okay? Like, do you know what you're doing? (laughs) And they say, well, I look back up and I say, yeah, I do. I'm going to be a preacher someday. I don't think I'm special, but I I say that story to say, I I don't remember a day where I wasn't a follower of Jesus. So (laughs) I never got to act crazy in my life. (laughs) I I didn't really want to, but I don't ever remember having the chance to. But somewhere along my journey in my family's household, they coronated me with a title. (laughs) And the title was Mr. Perfect. (laughs) That sounds like a cool title to most people. I mean, you're Mr. Perfect. You must be a great person. But they didn't use it in that way. Mr. Perfect was a pejorative in my family. (laughs) It was, you think you're Mr. Perfect. And it often came from my siblings, and sometimes it came from my parents. It was, oh, that's Mr. Perfect. And then when I would do something that they all didn't like or agree with, then they all would rally together, and they would, that's Mr. Perfect. I don't know if you've had a, had a label attached to you that you don't like, but I'd never liked Mr. Perfect. And the reason why I never liked Mr. Perfect is because somewhere along the way, I believed that I needed to be Mr. Perfect. And if I wasn't, then I was failing my family, and I was failing my God, and I was failing myself. Uh, There was a time when I was in elementary school, and I I was at a basketball camp, and you've heard me talk about basketball. It it really was the love of my life. Like From second grade, I loved basketball. I spent a lot of time practicing hours and hours every day over a thousand shots in my backyard or at the gym or wherever I could find a basketball court with a hoop that was 10 feet high. 
I would just spend hours and hours practicing. And over the summer, my parents would send me to basketball camps. Expensive. So my grandparents would pay for it. <laughs> and I would go to the Ohio State basketball camp. For me, that was the ultimate Ohio State basketball camp. From a small town boy to the Ohio State basketball camp. I was actually looking through VHS videos that my parents sent down to me recently, and I saw a video of me uh, in, in the tapes. I can't watch it because I don't have a VHS, but I saw in the tapes, Coy, fifth grade, Ohio State basketball camp. And someday I'll watch that. I don't remember if it was this year or not, but I was at the Ohio State basketball camp, and this particular year, I won every single individual award. I won the one-on-one -on -one competition, I won the foul shot competition, and I won the knockout competition. You're talking 500 players I'm up against, and I won every single one of them. And then my, and then my team won the five-on-five -five championship. And so the Ohio State basketball coaches saw me play in grade school and said, we think he's going to be really great someday. And so they invited me back to the camp the next week free of charge. And I'm thinking, wow, this is pretty cool. And so I stay another week, and I play basketball camp, and I start to win all those things again. I win the free throw competition, and I win the one-on-one -on -one competition, and I win the knockout competition, and then we get to the five-on-five -five championship. And I'm coming down the court, and, and, and it's not a long game, but I'm coming down the court, and it's in the last few seconds, and we're down by one point, and I have the ball all by myself. This is in grade school, so there's not a lot of people who can keep up with you. So I'm going down the court all by myself. And what's going through my mind is all the older players, who this may not make sense to you, all the older players who don't shoot a layup like this, they shoot a layup like this. So this is a normal layup like this. This is a finger roll. You finger roll. And I'm in the fifth grade thinking, I, I'm going to finger roll this because I... I want to prove to everybody that I'm the best. And so as I'm going down the court and I'm thinking about shooting this layup, I'm thinking, I got to do this. And so I got down there all by myself, nobody around me. And I shoot the finger roll. And what do you think happens? Missed it. But we got another chance. The other team got the ball, came back down. There was enough time. We got the ball again, and you're not going to believe what happened. The exact same thing happened. I got the ball by myself, dribbling down the court. It's my chance for the exact same shot a second time. And I'm thinking to myself, do I finger roll or do I not finger roll? Do I do a regular layup or do I go fancy? And I got so confused on what to do, I don't even remember what I did, but guess what happened? I missed it again. <laughs> And we lost. And I can tell you from that day forward, I could never shoot a layup confidently. Weird. I was the kid who lost the game twice <laughs> on the same shot. <laughs> and I carried that shame with me for a long time, and I've carried it with me in all areas of my life. If you live in my brain, it's not, it's not always so fun. Now, Brooklyn can tell you, my kids can tell you, it's just not fun sometimes. I, I want to give myself a break, but I can't. So if you take that little story of who I am, I, I was a kid who wanted to do what was good, and then I, I got the label Mr. Perfect, and then I, I make a big mistake and the most important thing in my life, basketball at the time. And then fast forward to today, and today I am a husband to Brooklyn. I am a dad to Kira and Maya. I am a friend who trains for marathons. I am a 41-year-old who goes to the gym at least four days a week. I am a pastor to this amazing church. I am an assistant cross-country coach for my daughter's school. I am a volleyball coach at a middle school. And amidst all those things, where I go wrong and where I struggle is, and where I get myself into trouble is that every single day I wake up and I realize that, Coy, you fall short of being the best. <laughs> and that's hard for me. I wake up and I realize, Coy, you fall short of being the best. You're meant to be Mr. Perfect. That's who you are. That's who people said. That's the label you've been given is you are Mr. Perfect. And so there's every single day of my life that I wake up and I realize I'm not the best preacher. I'm not the best speaker. I'm not the best fundraiser. I'm not the best church grower. I'm not the best dad. I'm not the fastest runner. I'm not the best husband. There's always somebody better and something better than I am. And there's days where that shame weighs heavy on me. 
But what I've learned is that the only way to heal from shame is to move the focus from what I'm not to who Jesus is. Because I am not perfect, but Jesus is. <laughs> and the perfect one has forgiven me for my imperfections. Remember I talked to you about the Israelites if you were to go to the book of Joshua, chapter 5, verse 9, you'll see that they've been wandering around for the 40 years after they've been freed from slavery. And then God says to Joshua, today, Joshua, today, I have rolled away the shame of your slavery in Egypt. I have rolled it away. I want you to know today that your enemy wants to tell you, shame on you. <laughs> your enemy wants to tell you, shame on you. Shame on you for doing that. Shame on you for failing at that. Shame on you for making that decision. Shame on you for never becoming that person. Shame on you for not getting that promotion. Shame on you for being too scared. Shame on you for breaking up on that relationship. Shame on you for not saying something when you should. The, the enemy wants to say to you, shame on you. But what God wants to say to you is, I've rolled the shame away. <laughs> That's what God wants to say to you. I've rolled the shame off of you. You are not what you did in the past. You are not what someone has done to you in the past. You are who Jesus says you are. And Jesus says you are free. And Jesus says you are forgiven. And Jesus says you are changed. And Jesus says you are redeemed. And Jesus says you are healed. And Jesus says you are chosen. And Jesus says you are complete. And Jesus says you are a child of God. The old is gone, and everything in you has become brand new because God has rolled away the shame. Will you let God roll away the shame tonight? I want to give you a chance. So what I want you to do, I want you to take out your phone <laughs> if you have it. If you don't have your phone, take out something to write on. And when you take out your phone... No selfies. <laughs> I want you to go to your notes. Whatever app you use to take notes, go to your notes. If you don't have a note app, go to your email. If you don't do email, why don't you come into the 21st century with us? <clears throat> so in your notes, I want you to type in these words. I am not and then dot, dot, dot. And then I want you to type in these words. So type in, I am not, dot, dot, dot. And then type in these words. Because of Jesus, I am, dot, dot, dot. I am not, dot, dot, dot. Because of Jesus, I am, dot, dot, dot. And this is going to be personal to every single one of you. But in a moment, I'm going to ask us to stand and pray. And as we pray, I want to take just a moment for you to think about who I am not. And because of Jesus, who I am. And I want you to write the answer in your notes. Because I want that to be the thing that you carry with you through this Christmas season and for the rest of your life. So if you're not sure what this looks like, let me give you a couple examples. I am not bad because of Jesus, I am forgiven. I am not broken because of Jesus, I am made new. I am not inadequate because of Jesus, I have been given and I am more than enough. So answer that question and fill in those blanks for yourself. I am not what? I am not perfect, but because of Jesus, I have been cleansed and made white as snow. Stand with me, will you? 
Go ahead and, and bow your heads a moment. We're talking about ghosts of Christmas past. There's been a lot of Christmas seasons in the past that you've carried some shame with you and you're trying to bring it with you into this Christmas and, and God is saying, don't listen to that ghost. <laughs> Let it go. But in order to do that, you're going to have to claim something tonight. You're going to have to claim, this is who I am not, but because of Jesus, this is who I am. So take a moment right now. I'm just going to let us be in silence as the band plays just a little bit behind me. And I want you to ask God, who am I not? And because of your son, who am I? Let's pray for a moment and think about that. God, speak truth. Speak truth over these people, your people. They need to hear what you say about them. Reveal to them what they are not. unforgivable they are not irredeemable they are not completed, completely destroyed they are not prisoners of our enemy they are not captives to sin They are not mean, they are not angry, they are not bitter, they are not unforgiving, they are not ugly, they are not dirty, they are not impure, they are not unwanted. Because of you, Jesus, because of you, because of your forgiveness, and because of your love, and because of your grace, because of your mercy and because of your glory and because of your perfection and because of your sacrifice and because you love every single person and because you are the creator and because you are the healer and because you are the one who takes dirt and and makes a beautiful creation because you speak truth into our life, because you cast out all fear, because you are always with us, because you help us pass through the seas, because you help us forgive those who have hurt us, God, because of you. We are made new. We are alive. We have great futures. We have a healthy marriage. We have new opportunities. We have a clear mind. We have a forgiving spirit. We have a, a heart that wants to follow you. We are beautiful. We are loving. We are kind. We are all the fruits of the Spirit, God. We are all the things that you want us to be because of you. So God, right now, speak truth over us. Let us hear the truth, God. Not let us live in fear. Fear wants to tell us all the things that have hurt us. And it wants to tell us if we get close to those things again, it will hurt so bad. It will hurt so bad that you won't be able to handle it. And so we walk around living in fear of the pain that we've already experienced in the past. And so we live with that shame day in and day out. And we miss things that you want to give us. And we don't open gifts that you'd offered us to 
have in our lives and we don't experience love that's right in front of us, God, because we're afraid, because we carry the shame. So God, right now, erase the shame. Remove it. And God, if there's someone here that is willing to confess, let them confess with me. God, I fall short. I'm not the best. I'm not perfect. And I never will be. Until the day you return. And you take every ugly thing about me cast it as far as the east is from the west. God, forgive me. I have been wrong. And make me new. In your name we pray.